If you're a dog person, then this is the video for you. Maya Gavan and Melanine, I'm Menek Swilaid. My name's Rainbow Dave, and welcome to the sixth video in our playlist untangling the great tale of Beren and Luthien. So, the last time I talked about Beren and Luthien, they had just been reunited in the ruins of Sauron's island of werewolves. Luthien threw down the walls of Tolly and Gowerhoth, Sauron's prisoners were freed from their dungeons, and Sauron himself was soundly beaten by Huan, the giant talking dog. And Huan is a character that I will focus on a lot in this video, but after so much drama and tragedy in the last video, I want to begin this one with a rare moment of happiness between our two main characters. You see, right in the middle of their epic quest to steal a Silmarilla from Morgoth's crown, Beren and Luthien take a bit of time off. They kind of take a break from their worries, and they just enjoy being in love together. Remember, despite the profundity of Beren and Luthien's love, they haven't actually spent a huge amount of time together at this point in the story. Beren first stumbled across Luthien one summer in the 464th year of the First Age, but he takes his time to introduce himself. Like, a full three quarters of a year, in fact. Remember, Beren was caught in like a sort of spell when he first saw Luthien dancing, and a chain was upon his limbs until the coming of spring in the next year. Then he spoke his first word to Luthien, and Luthien laid her hand in his, and they fell in love, and they had joy that no others of the children of Iluvatar have ever had. But that was only from spring to summer, only a few months at most. Then Beren was manhandled before the throne of Luthien's father, Eluthingol, and he was given the quest of reclaiming a Silmaril and returning with it in his hand to Doriath in order to earn Luthien's hand in marriage. And then he immediately departed for Nargothrond. So that was in the summer of the 465th year of the First Age, and before the end of that year, Fenrod Felagund was dead. And so, as autumn turns to winter and the year changes again, Beren and Luthien are finally free to renew their time of joy and to steal just a few more months of time together before returning to their life-threatening, world-changing quest. And although this vacation from their worries takes place during winter, and do remember that they're currently in the north of Beleriand, and Beleriand is to the north of Middle-earth, so winters in this part of the world are probably pretty brutal. Anyway, we're told that though winter came, it hurt them not. For flowers lingered where Luthien went, and birds sang beneath the snow-clad hills. And this description reminds me so much of the last time that we saw Luthien in winter, and the power that she demonstrated to release its bonds. When she first encountered Beren, we are told that flowers sprang from the cold earth where her feet had passed, and her songs melt frozen waters. It's such a cool part of Luthien's power, she is untouched by winter. However, while they are alone, Beren and Luthien have a decision to make. Now what do they do? On the one hand, Beren's quest will lead him north into Angband, but the only reason he's doing that is so that he can steal a Silmaril and give it to Luthien's father, and the only reason he's doing that is to earn the right to marry Luthien. But the truth is, he already has Luthien. They don't need a Silmaril, they can just be together, anywhere they want. Except that that's not really the honourable thing to do. Beren gave his word to Eluthingol, and besides, if Beren and Luthien just kind of ran away to some quiet corner of Middle-earth together, Luthien would go from a half Maya princess of Doriath to nobody, with nothing. And so Beren resolves to keep his vow, and to do all in his power to bring a Silmaril to Thingol in his hand. But this quest is crazy dangerous, and I don't believe Beren feels particularly good about bringing Luthien beyond Morgoth's front door and down into the depths of his fortress. Especially as, not far to the south of where they are now, lie the borders of Doriath, Luthien's home where she will at least be safe. But when Beren voices this thought, Luthien has something really wonderful to say. 
either he may choose a life of wandering upon the face of the earth, or he may choose to challenge the power of darkness upon its throne, but on either road I shall go with you, and our doom shall be alike. How lovely is that? Come hell or high water, Luthien will not leave Beren again. Anyway, during all this alone time, Huan makes himself scarce. He, of course, left Nargothrond with Luthien to help her escape from his master Kelegorm, and then he brought her to Beren's rescue as an act of compassion and love, but this adventure was not enough to make Huan disloyal. He still belongs at Kelegorm's side, although we are told that their love was less than before. However, Huan did not return to Nargothrond alone. Remember all those prisoners in Tol in Gawahoth that I mentioned a few moments ago? Well, now that they are free, they need somewhere to go, and there's nowhere safer for elven escapees than the secret underground realm of Nargothrond. And so, just for a few minutes, I will move away from Beren and Luthien, and I will follow Huan down to Nargothrond, where we will catch up with the despicable duo, Kelegorm and Kurufin the two worst sons of Feanor. So, when we last left Nargothrond, the rightful ruler and the steward was Oridreth, that's the younger brother of Fenrod Felagund. And now that Fenrod's gone, Oridreth is effectively the king in his own right. Nargothrond belongs to Oridreth. However, the people of Nargothrond, they belong to Kelegorm and Kurufin. Tolkien tells us that Oridreth had no power to withstand them, for they swayed the hearts of the people. But all of that begins to change with the return of Huan and the many former prisoners of Sauron's. The sudden influx of refugees brings tales of their rescue to Nargothrond, and the stories they tell do not reflect well on Kelegorm or Kurufin. So, the first thing to say is that everyone lamented bitterly the fall of Felagund, their king, but I imagine no one more so than Oridreth. Not only has Oridreth now lost the last of his brothers and his mentor, but he's also been thrust into a position of power that he does not want, and quite frankly, I don't think he seems ready for. But I would argue that he does pass his first test as king. You see, as Huan and the prisoners of Tol in Gawahoth relay the tale of their escape to the elves of Nargothrond, people start to ask questions of Kelegorm and Kurufin. Why is it, for example, that a maiden and a mere mortal have accomplished this thing that the sons of Feanor have not even attempted? Kelegorm and Kurufin talk a lot, but they spoke ill, very publicly, of Fenrod's decision to aid Beren. And yet that very quest is what brought down Sauron and laid ruin to his island of werewolves. And so the question is, why did Kelegorm and Kurufin abandon Fenrod in his time of need? Why did they speak so fiercely against him? Are they cowards? Well, the answer to that is decidedly no. Kelegorm and Kurufin are many things, but they are not afraid to get their hands dirty. And besides, I think cowards can be forgiven. Fear is a powerful thing, but it's not what motivates Kelegorm and Kurufin. These two are guided by treachery. And the people of Nargothrond finally perceive it. Their hearts were released from dominion and turned again to the house of Finarfin, and they obeyed Oradreth. However, the people of Nargothrond are not happy that they were manipulated and deceived by Kelegorm and Kurufin, and were actually told that they turned violent. There are some who desire to slay the brothers, but Oradreth stops them. And there's a few reasons that he makes this choice, but I think it's a very important kind of blink and you miss it moment in the history of the First Age. If you already know how the Silmarillion ends, then I'm sure you can think of a good few arguments why it would have been better if Oradreth did have Kelegorm and Kurufin executed right here in Nargothrond. Lives would be saved in the long run. But Oradreth lets them live. He lets them go. And although this may look like a moment of weakness or hesitation or inaction on Oradreth's part, I would actually strongly defend him, even knowing how all of this plays out. 
You see, Tolkien tells us that one of the reasons that Orodreth forbade the uh, lynching of Kelegorm and Kuravin is that the spilling of kindred blood by kin, kin slaying, that's what set Kelegorm and Kuravin down such a dark road in the beginning. After swearing their oath to reclaim the Silmarils, the first thing that Feanor and his sons did was murder a whole bunch of innocent elves, innocents of Orodreth's mother's people. For blood ye shall render blood. That's what Mandos said in his prophetic doom, and I think Orodreth realises that elves killing elves, and particularly him killing his own cousins, would bind the curse of Mandos more closely upon them all. So he lets them live. But this also very much reminds me of some words of wisdom that Tolkien wrote a lot later in The Lord of the Rings and then gave to Gandalf. Many that live deserve death, and some that die deserve life. Can you give it to them? Then do not be too eager to deal out death in judgment, for even the very wise cannot see all ends. Pity and mercy are crucial themes in all of Tolkien's works, and so I think wishing that Orodreth had been awesome enough to kill Kelegorm and Kuwifin kind of misses the point of what makes Orodreth awesome. It's not flashy or particularly cinematic, but it is very admirable. Anyway, just because Orodreth doesn't kill his cousins doesn't mean he doesn't punish them at all. We are told that Kelegorm and Kuwifin would never again be granted bread or rest within Orodreth's realm, and they're effectively banished from Nargothrond. We're even told that Orodreth swore that there should be little love between Nargothrond and the sons of Feanor thereafter. And I think in this moment we see a little bit of the difference in personality between Kelegorm and Kuwifin by looking at the very different ways in which they react to this banishment. Kelegorm, he shouts, let it be so, and there was a light of menace in his eyes, but Kuwifin smiled. They each take a horse and they ride away like fire, but very, very interestingly, we are told that their own people did not go with them, for all perceived that the curse lay heavily upon the brothers and that evil followed them. And what makes this especially cool is that Kuwafin's own son is among the elves who repudiate his evil deeds and who remain loyal to Orodreth in Nargothrond. A few videos ago, I mentioned Celebrimbor, the son of Kuwafin and the grandson of Feanor. And Celebrimbor is going to go on to become one of the chief characters of the early Second Age. He is the guy who forges the Rings of Power alongside Sauron. He alone forges the three elven rings and then he fights an epic battle against the Dark Lord. Celebrimbor is awesome. But the first time that Tolkien mentions him chronologically is right here, in Nargothrond, where he turns against his evil father and dedicates his life to a much worthier cause. Anyway, perhaps surprisingly, Huan does not do what Celebrimbor does. Instead of repudiating his master, Huan follows Celegorm into banishment. And although this may seem strange, I think it's just a testament to Huan's loyalty. He has a true heart, and when push comes to shove, he will go against his master for the sake of doing what's right, but when that's done, he will return, and he will do his duty as a faithful wolfhound. So, Kelegorm, Kuwafin, and Huan are kind of running out of places where they're still welcome, and so they decide that their next home should be in the east of Beleriand, right here upon the Hill of Himring. And of course, the Hill of Himring is the stronghold of their eldest brother, Mayadros, who stands as the sole bastion of resistance against Morgoth in the east. However, getting all the way from the southwest of Beleriand to the northeast is not an easy thing to do, especially considering what lies in the middle. So, as I'm sure you guys all know, no one is allowed to pass beyond the Girdle of Melian and enter Doriath without the permission of the king or queen, which Kelegorm and Kurofian absolutely do not have. In fact, they are probably the two people that Thingol hates most at this point. 
But they also don't want to pass too far to the north of Doriath, as that land is the dark valley of Nandungorthib, the valley of dreadful death, where the spawn of Ungoliant dwell. It's one of the scariest places in Beleriand, so Kelegorm, Kurufin, and Huan decide to make for the empty land of Dimbar, and approach Himring, travelling just above the north marches of Doriath. However, before they can get there, they are going to have to travel through the forest of Brethiel. And this segues us perfectly back to Beren and Luthien. Because the last time that we saw them, they had just escaped Tol Sirion, and they were wandering south to avoid the worst of the winter, which puts them exactly here, the forest of Brethiel. And no doubt you guys can already tell where I'm going with this, because while Kelegorm and Kurifin are riding through the forest of Brethiel, they espy Beren and Luthien from afar. And you will not be in the slightest bit surprised to hear that upon seeing them, Kelegorm does the absolute worst thing imaginable. With zero provocation, he turns his horse and spurs it upon Beren. Which brings us to one of the most cinematic moments in the entire Silmarillion. This next action scene is so, so, so cool. And although there are lots of things in the Silmarillion that I don't think should be adapted for a movie, this next part would be awesome to see on screen. So, Kelegorm is charging towards Beren with his spear raised, while Kurufin charges at Luthien. And because Kurufin was a strong and cunning horseman, he is able to swerve and stoop and pull Luthien up onto his saddle. And as this happens, Beren, who is about to be skewered by Kelegorm, springs out of the way of his spear, and in the same movement he leaps onto the speeding horse of Kurufin as it passed. And what makes this especially cool is that in the Silmarillion, this leap of Beren's is capitalised. It's not like leap the verb, it is leap the proper noun. This leap of Beren's is a stunt that will become renowned in the songs of elves and men. It's so epic that it becomes a historical event in the annals of Middle-earth. I know movie Legolas gets some pretty cool moments, but I'm pretty sure none of them are renowned in song by elves and men. I mean, I don't know, maybe in the movies there was some guy of Rohan who totally did write a song about Legolas's shield surfing at Helm's Deep, but if not, that's one point to Beren. Anyway, now that Beren and Kurufin and Luthien are all atop the same speeding horse, Beren took Kurufin by the throat from behind and hurled him backward and they fell to the ground together. The horse rears up and Luthien is thrown off, but Kelegorm is still charging towards them. As Beren throttled Kurufin, death was near him, for Kelegorm rode upon him with a spear. But in this moment, Beren's life is saved not by Luthien, but by Huan. As Kelegorm's spear flashed, Huan forsook his service and sprang upon him so that his horse swerved aside and would not approach Beren because of the terror of the Great Hound. And this is it. Huan and Kelegorm were on shaky ground anyway before the whole Tol in Gawahoth thing, but this is the end of their relationship. Huan will never follow Kelegorm again. We are told that Kelegorm curses his former dog, but Huan was unmoved. Anyway, while that's going on, it seems that Beren is still choking the life out of Kurufin, and the only reason that he doesn't kill Kurufin is the intervention of Luthien. So, just like Oradreth, Luthien understands the value of mercy and the profound consequences of kinslaying, and so she forbade the killing of Kurufin. However, there are no rules against looting a vanquished foe, and so Beren takes from Kurufin his gear and his weapons, and among them is a particularly important knife that is remembered as Angrist. Now, remember that knife, it'll become very significant in next week's video, and just to foreshadow why, I will tell you exactly what Angrist means. Because that ang prefix, it shows up over and over and over again in elven words. We see angband, angrod, angayanor, the witch king of angmar, and what it means is iron. 
And just as orcrist means the orc cleaver, angerist means the iron cleaver. And the reason for that is because this is the dagger with which Beren is going to try and cut a Silmaril from Morgoth's iron crown. But I'll talk all about that in the next video. Anyway, Beren lifted Kurufin and flung him from him, and he said to Kurufin, Your horse I keep for the service of Luthien, and it may be accounted happy to be free of such a master. Which is a sick burn, but then Kurufin curses Beren by saying, Go hence unto a swift and bitter death. But Beren doesn't care, he just turned away and took no heed of their words. Which brings us to what is probably Kurufin's absolute lowest low. He jumps up onto his brother's horse, and in shame and malice he takes Kelegorm's bow, draws back an arrow, and aims it at Luthien. And I think it's interesting to note that shame and malice are two of the exact same words that Tolkien used to describe Melkor way, way back in the beginning of the Silmarillion, when Melkor first wove discord and corruption into the theme of creation. Melkor was filled with shame, of which came secret anger. So there you go, Kurafin. You know you're a bad guy when Tolkien compares you to Melkor. Anyway, luckily, as Kurufin loosed this arrow, Huan leapt up and caught it in his mouth. But then Kurufin does the exact same thing again. He shoots another arrow at Luthien, and this time it is Beren who springs before her and takes the arrow of Kurufin right in his breast. Kelegorm and Kurufin then fled into the east in fear, as their former wolfhound Huan pursued them. And this is actually the very last time that we see Kelegorm and Kurufin in the tale of Beren and Luthien, but it is absolutely not the last time we will see them in the Silmarillion, although it is the last time we see them for a little while. It seems that Kelegorm and Kurufin do indeed successfully make it to Himring, where they lick their wounds and they lay low for a while, but I think it's worth noting that the rest of Beleriand now knows what awful people they are. They can't use charm and deception to manipulate people anymore, no one's gonna trust them. And we'll see how this has major ramifications for the oldest brother of Kelegorm and Kurufin, Myathros. Because it is to Myathros that Kelegorm and Kurufin go, and they bring with them their horrendous reputation. And so, although Myathros is a worthy son of Feanor, and he is doing noble work in the east to resist and repel the armies of Morgoth, now he is saddled with these two losers, and they really have tarnished the already pretty dodgy reputation of the sons of Feanor. There will come a time in the very next story that I go through where Myathros will need the support of the elves of Nargothrond, but they won't send aid because they don't trust his brothers. It's so infuriating. Reason 101 to hate Kelegorm and Kurufin. Anyway, the good news is that I won't need to talk about them for quite some time now, but the bad news is that Beren has just been shot. Now, luckily, Huan doesn't spend too long pursuing his former master, and he soon returns to Luthien and the injured Beren with a herb out of the forest. Now, we aren't explicitly told what this leaf is, but I think one of the safest guesses would be that it is Athalas, King's Foil, the very same healing weed that Aragorn will use more than once in The Lord of the Rings. And with the herb of Huan and the arts of Luthien's love, Beren is eventually healed, and they return together to Doriath. But this is where Beren is once again torn between his oath to Thingol and his love for Luthien. And the reason that this doubt enters his mind right now is because Luthien is finally safe again. She's finally back home within the guarded kingdom of her parents. And if Beren lets her come with him to Angband, he will be leading the fairest of all the children of Iluvatar into almost certain torment and death. And so, one morning, Beren awoke early, before the sun, and while Luthien was still sleeping upon the grass, he committed her to the care of Huan, and left in great anguish. 
And you might be thinking this is kind of frustrating. Like, they've already had this conversation and Luthien has already told Beren, on either road I shall go with you and our doom shall be alike. But don't worry, because Beren's whole plan to sneak away and complete the quest on his own is about as futile as Frodo's plan to sneak off alone and complete his quest. Frodo had a Sam and Beren had a Luthien. But as Beren rides off north without her, he does believe that he is saying farewell to her forever. And so he sings a goodbye song to love and light. And in the Silmarillion, we are given a part of this song, but in Canto 11 of the Lay of Lathian, we actually get the whole thing. Farewell, sweet earth and northern sky, forever blessed, since here did lie, and here with lissom limbs did run, beneath the moon, beneath the sun, Luthien Tinuviel, more fair than mortal tongue can tell. Though all to ruin fell the world, and were dissolved and backward hurled unmade into the old abyss, yet were its making good for this, the dawn, the dusk, the earth, the sea, that Luthien on a time should be. And I think there's a really beautiful sentiment here, because what Beren's basically saying is that although the world is full of darkness and discord, and that any number of awful things can and very well might happen in the future, the entire world could be undone in fire and ruin, but that's okay. It's worth it. Because for a time, Luthien existed. Just by living in it, Luthien makes a marred world good. Anyway, it turns out that as Beren sings this goodbye song to life and the world, Luthien hears him, and she sings a song of her own in answer. And the reason that Luthien is able to hear this song is that although Beren left her in Doriath, committed to the care of Huan, Huan understands that what's best for Luthien is letting her make her own decisions. I guess he knows that whatever suffering may await her on the quest of the Silmaril is only a fraction of the suffering that she will endure if she's left alone without Beren. So, although I guess it's kind of sweet that Beren wanted to protect Luthien, it was never a particularly realistic goal. As both Luthien and Tolkien have explicitly stated, their dooms lie together. Whatever happens to one must also happen to the other. And so Huan lets Luthien ride on his back once more, and he bears her swiftly hard on Beren's trail. But before Huan and Luthien catch up to Beren, they first take a little detour back to Tol in Gawahoth. And the reason for this is that he and Luthien are going to need disguises if they're to successfully make it past the gates of Angband. And so this brings us back to two characters that I talked about the last time we were in Tol in Gawahoth. One is Draugluin, the first werewolf and the sire of that entire evil race, and the other is Thuringwethil, the super mysterious vampire who once served as Sauron's herald. Now obviously we know that Draugluin was slain by Huan, and although we know absolutely nothing about the details of Thuringwethil's death, we do know that she's dead, and so using some kind of elven magic, or perhaps even some magic of Huan's, we're not really told, Huan and Luthien change their shape into the Wolfheim and Batfell of Draugluin and Thuringwethil. They wear their forms as dreadful garments. Just like Finrod did a few videos ago, they basically shapeshift into their fallen enemies. And so, when Luthien and Huan do finally catch up with Beren, what he sees approaching him are not his lover and his friend the dog, but instead a ghastly vampire and a werewolf. And it's not until Luthien casts aside her disguise that he figures out what's actually going on. So once again, Beren strives to dissuade Luthien from following him into danger, but this time it is not Luthien who answers him. She must be getting pretty tired of repeating herself. Instead, it is Huan. And remember, Huan is only permitted to speak three times in his life. And he's already spoken once to Luthien. So what Huan says to Beren is the second to last thing that he will ever be allowed to say. 
Anyway, what Huan says to Beren is this. From the shadow of death, you can no longer save Luthien, for by her love she is now subject to it. You can turn from your fate and lead her into exile, seeking peace in vain while your life lasts. But if you will not deny your doom, then either Luthien, being forsaken, must assuredly die alone, or she must, with you, challenge the fate that lies before you. Hopeless, yet not certain. And so, finally, Baron gets it into his head that there is simply no way for Luthien to be divided from the doom that lies upon them both, and he finally stops trying to dissuade her from joining him. By the Council of Huan and the Arts of Luthien, Beren was transformed into the werewolf shape of Draugluin, and I assume Huan turned back into his regular self, because although Huan still has plenty of epically important things to do in this story, he can't follow his friends on this stage of their quest. And that is because Beren and Luthien are now within sight of the Gates of Angband. The time has come for our heroes to attempt something that no other character in the Legendarium has ever done before or will ever do again. They are going to try and sneak inside the Iron Prison of Morgoths and ideally sneak back out again with a Silmaril in their possession. And so, that's what I'll talk about in the next video, the most daring part of the quest so far, the part that takes Beren and Luthien all the way before the throne of the Dark Lord. We'll get to see Angband up close, we'll get to see Morgoth in his element, and we'll also meet a brand new villain, the mightiest wolf ever to walk the world. So to make sure you don't miss that, hit subscribe if you haven't already, and don't forget to hit like and leave a comment on this video if you want to. Anyway, as always, until next time, my dear friends, much love, stay groovy, and Nevaya Melanine. <laughs>